Sure. You want to speak into this one or you want to use this one? Yes. All right, guys, there's still some folks upstairs, but they'll, they'll probably trickle down uh, hopefully soon. So, welcome to Duo Tech Talks. My name's John Overhide, uh, co founder and CTO at Duo here. Um, we're excited to have uh, Mario with us today. Um, before we get started, anyone have any announcements? Local events? Jobs? Right here, Mr. Mr. Docker. Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, Hi, I'm uh, Elliot from uh, Deepfield Networks. Uh, we are hiring uh, backend and uh, generalist positions, um, junior and senior. Um, yeah, so talk to me afterwards or go to jobs at uh, jobs.deepfield.net. Thanks, back there. Do that with Martin's equipment. Hi, um, I work for Arbor Networks, A R B O R, and uh, we are hiring for both front end and back end positions. Uh, go to arbornetworks.jobs. So, we got the new GTLD. Wow. Must be cool. I was going to say, you guys don't have the dot jobs, but sheesh. Wow. Advanced technology. Anybody else? I <laughs> uh, work for a company called CampDoc uh, here in town, and we are hiring for a front end and a back end position currently. So talk to me after if you're interested. What was it? CampDoc? CampDoc. CampDoc. Yep. Spelled like it sounds. Cool. Yep. And anything else? Anybody else looking for jobs? Everyone else is happily employed. <laughs> yeah. Raise your hand and then people will swarm you later. You don't have to like give a, a your resume on the microphone or anything. <laughs> cool. So um, at Duo here, we're we're growing really rapidly and hiring a uh, boatload of people um, on the software engineering side. So. Front end, back end, everything front in between. End. What? Someone said front end? Front end. B-Spoon front end. needs your help. Front end. Yeah. Front end. Can't do it all himself. He doesn't, but yep. we love him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're also hiring on um, the security side as well. If you're interested in application security um, or DevOps, DevOps security, security ops, some combination of those words, um, we'd like to talk to you. <laughs> And if you're not technical and you like to make a lot of money in sales or um, help market duo, come talk to us as well. Um, anything else? Local events going on? MySec, ArbSec, where's Zach? He's upstairs. ArbSec happens the first Wednesday of each month if you guys are interested in security and booze and bars and presentations. Whoa. Go check it out. Basically the same as Duo Tech Talks except Less emphasis on the bars part of it, except that we usually go to the bar after, so I guess it's somewhat similar. Um, nothing else? Cool. There's the full moon event. Yes. <laughs> Is that the same as Festival Pools? Yeah. Well, it's the same people, but it's called full moon. Yeah. So go downtown later tonight, and crazy stuff will be happening in Ann Arbor. There's a beer tent. There's a beer tent. That's all that matters. So, um, 
Quick introduction to, to Mario. I don't want to read his bio, um, but what I know of Mario is he is a true web wizard. When it comes to web security, there's not many people that are better. So when he tells me of some guy that he's working with who is like super awesome in web security, I fear because I thought Mario was the tip top of, of web security. Um, but apparently there's one person out there that's better uh, than Mario, but. I'm just getting older. We'll have them for the next month, okay. You know. <laughs> but um, if you follow Mario's Twitter feed, which is how I first interacted with, with Mario, um, he's got some, some crazy handle, Mario in, in ASCII hacks, I guess is, is what it is. Um, it kind of just looks like, if you remember um, R Snake's XSS cheat sheet from way back when, it looks like that, but on drugs. Like, you can't even process what he's tweeting. Like, usually if you just follow him on Twitter, your browser will just explode because he has some of the craziest XSS evasions and web security things that are so far on the tip of the iceberg that only, you know, a handful of people in the world actually understand um, what he's talking about. Um, I think this presentation will be more accessible to, to the audience, um, and it should be a, a fun time. I've heard it involves lots of Justin Bieber references, which I know we're all big fans. Yeah, we're all, we're all believers. <laughs> um, and um, Mario uh, finished his PhD a couple years ago, so you have to dress him as Dr. Mario and make Nintendo noises at the same time. And uh, more recently, Mario um, uh, started a, a consulting group called Cure53. If you go to cure53.de, um, it is a, a German company, and Mar Mario joined us all the way from uh, Germany for this weekend. Um, so if you have any needs in the web security space, any consulting gigs, pen tests, and you want the best guys in web security, give Mario a call. So without further ado, please welcome Mario to Duo Tech Talks. Thank you very much. So, can everybody hear me? Is, that, is the microphone setting okay? Excellent, excellent. You can hear me as well in the last row, or it's fine. Font sign is sufficient. All right, cool. So uh, I'm coming from a time zone that is called CEST, which is Central European Summer Time, so you can kind of imagine what my time is right now. So if I do crash and just fall down in embryonic position, wait for eight hours, I will wake up myself, and the presentation will continue, I promise. <laughs> so uh, the talk is called Copy and Pest. You might ask yourself, what that actually means. And I'm going to talk about a case study on the clipboard and something that is invisible and does things. Among other things, it does cross-site scripting, XSS, but it does more, and uh, I didn't find time to explore all the options that this attack pattern shows us, but at least some, and I kind of want to introduce them. My name is Mario. Uh, thanks, John, for the nice intro. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Ruhr University in Bochum, where I'm still employed with like a 20% position in white papers and stuff. Um, eight years ago, we created a security company that was supposed to be like a one-man project, but uh, meanwhile, we're kind of out of the closet, and we're 12 people, and we essentially do pen tests. No APT, no threat modeling, no Chinese unit P00P, just like pen tests. <laughs> and I think we're quite okay, so if you want to write me a mail, I would be very happy about that. Um, I publish a lot, I publish a bunch of papers, uh, wrote, wrote about of books, um, speak on conferences, and I maintain a bunch of open source projects, among them the HMF5 security cheat sheet, which is a collection of attack tools that you can use to assess the security of your own web applications very, very quickly. And uh, since recently we, may, we started maintaining, um, or started inventing and then maintaining the DOM Purify project, which is essentially like an open source client-side cross-site scripting filter that has the premise of being as tolerant as possible and not working like the majority of cross-site scripting filters that just strip out everything, but we want to be as permissive as possible, allow SVG, allow MathML, and only strip out the bad stuff, and uh, we're quite happy with that. My Twitter handle is, as mentioned, the 0x something something. I can't even remember myself, and if you want to drop me a message, then just like write me an email. It's going to work. There's SMIM and PGP and everything's there. Um, my fellow Americans, this talk will introduce a novel attack vector that poses a threat. Not the biggest one, not the worst, but uh, it's a threat, and it's an interesting one because I had a long look at this topic, and I found some prior art, but I didn't find any prior art that was exactly describing this thing. 
The attack that I'm going to show you is requiring a little bit of user interaction, but I think it's plausible user interaction because it doesn't require the user to jump to burning hoops and do this and do that, and then the attack executes, but only do something that we do every single day. And there's my first question. Whoever uses copy and paste? <laughs> Almost everyone. You don't. Why don't you? Well, that's, that's, that's sad. Um, the good thing about my attack is that it also has a logo because every good attack has a logo. And it was created by Ange Albertini. I think you know this guy. Um, he's pretty prolific. And that is pretty much expressing perfectly what the whole thing is about. So you have this thing here, which is a piece of paper that is almost blank. And then you send it into the copy machine, and then it comes out, and there's an ant on it or a bug. And we like bugs, right? We're security people. Well, I'm not going to talk about Xerox or copy machines, but I'm going to talk about something that we do every day, as we just found out, that is copying and pasting. We're going to have a look what that really is what that really means, what the clipboard actually is, and what kind of security implications are arising from that. So to make sure that you really know what I mean, because it's going to get to be a bit complex, I want to show you like the big boom at the very beginning of this talk. And this big boom goes along with a little story. We're kind of imagining that there is a guy, he's called Mr. Derp. And Mr. Derp wants to write Mrs. Derpina a message. And he likes Gmail because it's like in the web and browsers and uh, emails and browsers and webmail with HTML out. It's a really great idea. And he opens his Gmail and he starts writing a message. And this is the very moment where we might have to switch on to the uh, demo thing here right now. Excellent, thank you so much. So this is my computer and I have two browsers open. Well, would be one, would be fine, but we're gonna see two to demonstrate the impact. And we wanna start writing a mail. So we click on compose, we write something in here and something in here, and that didn't work as I expected it, and some subject, whatever. And then we want to compose the message. But we won't just start writing because we have something from the document that someone sent us, and we want to copy and paste something from the document into our HTML email. And why wouldn't we? I mean, it's, it's kind of a natural thing. So we go to open office, and we start typing something. It's like, hello, Derpina. How is you? Uh, that is partly true. We're going we're gonna to talk about this later on. So we take this thing, we copy it, we go back to Gmail, and we throw it in there. And then we, oops, what's that? We click somewhere on the screen, and we have like mail.google.com. That looks like, oh, that's bad. That, there is an XSS. Like the entire user interface, after pasting into Gmail, is completely plugged and bugged with the crosshead scripting. So someone apparently gave control over our browser by just having us copy paste something from somewhere, and then that happened. Now you might say, this is definitely a Firefox issue because we're well, Firefox. But you can also do this in Chrome, for example, and uh, where is my Chrome? There we go. Not, <laughs> I think. There we go. So we go to the Compose window in latest Chrome and we do the same thing. It's not as nice, it's not covering the whole thing because I was too lazy to optimize the attack. But again, you can see, it's like almost browser independent. Even in Chrome, we get like mail.google.com. Um, at the last conference where I was showing this demo, people were actually writing me messages into this account. You're not doing this because no one has a laptop. Thank you so much. This was pretty vulgar. And yeah, so that's weird, right? We're having here an empty open office document. We start writing something into this document. We copy this thing. We paste it into Gmail or any other browser application. Then all of a sudden, we have a cross-site scripting. It's like, that's, that's kind of weird. And now would be a good moment to switch back to the actual presentation. Thank you. So now questions arise. <laughs> and these questions are like, how, the, how, the, why, how is it possible? Because those two applications are seemingly unrelated, right? I mean, we know that there is XSS on the browser. And there have been countless presentations, papers, tools, and whatnot about cross-site scripting. But we're copying something that is not the browser, that is like a completely different software. And then we put it into the browser, and all of a sudden something executes. It's kind of bad, because we don't expect this, and we don't even see something of it, because it looks completely benign. Like the font size, uh, the font name is cool, the font size is cool, and so on, everything is fine. So we want to find out what actually happened here. And we also want to find out why it really happened, because this is kind of weird, and this might actually strike us. I personally do, in fact, sometimes open a document in a PDF reader, or open office, or something else, copy it, and then throw it into my mails. I don't use web interfaces for that, which is good, but uh, I know people who do. And thus, we want to know what's going on here. So 
we've seen an attack that is apparently capable of abusing the clipboard to contain payload that only executes in certain scenarios. One of them would be the browser. Maybe there is more. The first application was open office. The second one was the browser. Maybe with other applications this works as well, but we need to find out why this actually happens and what the technical background of this whole thing is. Um, so to understand or to be able to understand where this kind of attack is coming from, how this works and why this works and how we can manipulate documents or something in the middle to cause this effect, we need to understand what the clipboard actually is and where it came from and what it does today and how it changed over time. And uh, it's quite interesting because we have to go back in time a little bit and talk about the very origins of the clipboard, what it is and where it came from. And actually, if you want to go really far back, then the clipboard is actually in its origins located in the medieval ages when they had like handwritten books, manuscripts. And one of the manuscripts was starting to rot or worms were getting to it and eating up the pages. And the monks were taking this book and trying to rescue it, but they were too lazy to kind of retype or rewrite the whole book with their geese feathers. So they just took like scissors or other sharp instruments and cut parts of the book. And then they took them and glued them together for the new book so they saved time because that was effectively more efficient. In the 70s and the years before, we still had the possibility for editors to just use scissors and kind of tape movie stripes together and stuff like that. So that is the very origin of cut and paste. You cut something from somewhere and then you take it and paste it into something else and you preserve the most of it just to save time. This is Apple's Lisa. Who still knows it? I don't. It was basically invented before I was born. Uh, no, after I was born. No, before I was born, actually. So that's quite cool. Um, and this computer was one of the first computers who supported a feature that we nowadays know as the clipboard. And I think Apple actually called it the clipboard. It gave us the possibility to not only do cut and paste, to take something, remove it from where it was before, hold it in a temporary storage, and then paste it into something new, but they also supported copy and paste. So to take something, duplicate it, keep it in a temporary storage, and then use it as a different location. But basically, there was like text. So you could take a string of text and copy and paste it from A to B. Not that spectacular, but most importantly, they were the first ones to call it the clipboard. Now, there's this funny story, and I'm, I hope I'm getting it right because it was, was a lot of research and digging into old documents. I think in 1992, correct me if I'm wrong, um, IBM published a tech paper that was basically describing the possibilities and the capabilities of the modern clipboard, what we could actually do with this. Before that, there was basically, okay, the clipboard is there, but it contains text, and that's basically it. But IBM said, like, no, we have to do way, 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 way more because there's complex applications who can do complex things. And why not create the clipboard as like an object storage, as like an entity that is capable of holding various objects of different types. So once we copy something, we put a bunch of buckets into that clipboard with different types and different contents. And then the other application that is receiving the information, because it might not be the same application, can decide which one of those buckets are fitting best and which one of those buckets it should choose and then process. Um, in 1995, Microsoft saw this tech report, or maybe even a bit earlier, and they said, like, that's pretty cool. Let's put a patent on it. And they did so, and it arrived in Windows. And Windows 3.1 was, to my knowledge and to my research, the first operating system that featured a complex object-oriented clipboard that could contain several complex buckets with different data, even though you only copied one certain thing, and had the other application that was pasted in to decide which one of the buckets to take. So the clipboard today hasn't fundamentally changed from what we saw from these uh, mid-90s. It's basically a storage for intermediate data. You see something from one application that supports complex data layouting, complex information, files, whole folders, audio waves, bitmaps, whatever you want to think of, puts it into a temporary location and makes it available for other applications to take it. And to make sure that there is like a certain level of compatibility, the clipboard is designed in this object-oriented manner. Like there are several buckets with several types and the other application can decide which bucket of which type to take and process. And this is holding for copy and paste, cut and paste, and even drag and drop. So if you drag something from Word into another application, then there is these buckets that are being created and the other application can choose which bucket is the right one. Um, I wanted to find out if there's any tools that give me transparency 
or transparency on what is actually stored inside my clipboard. I know that there's a bunch of APIs in Windows and in other operating systems, but I'm far too lazy to program myself. So I was looking for a tool that shows me what the raw contents of the clipboard are because I wanted to know what's going on. And I also wanted to know how this kind of weird artifact that we saw in the first five minutes occurred. And I found a tool from the year 2003. I think it's written by a German dude. Uh, according to the name, he must be German because he has umlauts. And his name is Peter Budner. You would probably say Budner, but I say Budner. That's like important knowledge. Um, and uh, this does nothing else but show you the raw content of the clipboard alongside those buckets. So we see here that it's the tool. We have the list of buckets that we have. We see here there's a bucket that is called CF underscore text. CF underscore Unicode text, CF underscore uh, and so on, locale, OEM text. And we also see a bucket that is called HTML format, rich text format, OLE private data, and so on. You can click those buckets, and then you get the content of those buckets. And it's going to tell you precisely what is going on in your clipboard. That is nice. So I decided to try this tool and have a look what's going on. Um, the good thing is this runs on Windows, but if you want to run it on Linux, and I, did, I had a hard time in finding something that is doing the same thing on Linux, but then a friend of mine, Dave, he just pointed me to the fact that, have you tried it with wine? It's like, oh, no, shoot, I should have. Yeah, it also runs with wine. So you can also have a look at the clipboard. On uh, Linux, I mean, of course, it's giving you s small differences because it's still running on wine. But it does the job and gives you transparency on what's going on there. So yes, um, this is what you do when you, for example, open a text file that is called justin.txt and contains something about Justin Bieber. And you copy this text. So the original joke was that when I first showed it in a conference, that whenever you see something Bieber related on the slides, you would have to shout beeps, and then you would get a free beer. But it's kind of pointless here because you have free beer already. Uh, hit me after the talk. We do, we're going to do this beeps thing. Um, I'm going to tell you a cool O-Day. Is that, is that fine? So from now on, if you see a Justin Bieber reference on the slides, I want you to shout beeps. And the one who shouts beeps for the first time will get to hear this amazing O-Day. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, that doesn't count. That's a nice thing. <laughs> For the next slides. So um, to get back to the topic, um, we open something in Notepad, which is a notably simple application. We have some text here. We select the text. We copy the text. And then we, we have a look at the clipboard. And we see that, again, we have these kinds of buckets here. And you might think that for plain text coming out of Notepad, there shouldn't be that much. But still, there is four buckets. There is a Unicode text bucket a CF locale bucket, a CF text bucket, and a CF OAM text bucket. And they all contain slightly different things. So apparently, even for plain text, there's many representations to create and for other applications to choose from. So we see there's something, there's something interesting going on here. So there might, be, there might be more. And there might be something that explains that weird behavior that we saw in the first five minutes. So here we have, who was it? Who was the first? Who was the first? It was the, excellent. One all day for you. Um, here we have Microsoft Word 2013. And it's about Justin Bieber, you're my hero. Please follow me on Twitter. And we copied this thing. And then we have a look, with, we have a look at the, the application. And we have a look at the list of buckets that Word apparently creates after copying the stuff from you know, the document. And we see that there is like a data object, an object descriptor, rich text format. Mm, I love rich text format. It's one of the best languages ever. HTML format, CF text, Unicode text, enhanced metafile, metafile, picked, embed source, native only link, link source, link source, desk object link, all private data, CF locality, of M text. And I'm consciously highlighting the HTML format thing here because what you see in here, I hope you can see it, is like disgusting HTML. It's just like if you like HTML, you're like, this, oh, come on, who wrote this? <laughs> yes, a machine wrote this because it's ugly. It's like Microsoft Office's representation of what HTML should look like, and it's an abomination. So, but you can see that someone is apparently generating HTML in hope that someone else who is receiving the data upon pasting is taking that HTML and showing it, whoever that may be. But so the point is that, uh, that, that Microsoft Office is actually generating this HTML, which is getting more interesting because we now see that there's not only plain text, there's also formatted text. And the application has to decide how it should look like. And maybe we can, maybe we can mess with that. So nicely done. Who was that? I don't have that many O-days. <laughs> You're disqualified. <laughs> no. uh, so this is the actual HTML that Office is creating for us. And you can see, I just like, does anybody like, is your front-end people? I know there's one front-end person. I mean, does this look good to you? 
So, this is horrible. This is horrible in HTML. Like, if Tim Berners Lee saw that, he would like he would end the internet. Which is like, stop it. Let's shut it down again. It's, I have enough. So. We see that there's a bunch of, bunch of things in here, and we also see the Justin stuff in here. And that is important, because we see a direct correspondence from what we had here. This is not eligible for a beep. Um, a direct correspondence of the text and the markup. Here's the Justin, you're my hero, Twitter, and so on. So we see that there's things that we can influence in the document, and then they arrive inside the HTML in the clipboard. And that's getting more interesting. Like, hmm, maybe, maybe quick, we can mess with that. So factually. We learned right now that the clipboard is a complex beast and that it does stuff that we do not always know and we almost never see it because we almost never have a look at this. We just assume that everything's fine and that the applications are doing their job right because they always do, right? And uh, factually, there's a lot of things happening. Once I press Control C, a lot of things are happening. One of them is that 13 buckets are being created in Microsoft Word and maybe even more buckets in other software. We don't know, no one knows. We have to have a look at that. I didn't, just for some cases. And essentially, that one software creates those buckets, you have it in this intermediate storage, and then the other software decides which one of the buckets to take, to choose from, and then does something with it. And you never know how the software creates the buckets in the first place, and what the other software does when receiving those buckets. We have no idea what's going on, and it's hard to debug. So, um, <laughs> if this was for a beer, if this was for a beer, I would have said something right now by now, because this evening wouldn't have ended well. Um, so here, for example, we can see what happens if you just copy a file. Um, and there's, again, a bunch of buckets that are describing data objects, shell ID, L list arrays, data object attributes, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is just for a file, which is usually references, partly of the file content, file name, and so on, file path, and so on. So depending on what you copy, you will always see different objects in the clipboard. And this tool gives them to us. So now let's talk about security, because we basically just caught up with the overall topic and learned what the clipboard is and that there is more than we maybe hoped or liked. And now let's ask ourselves, can we manipulate what is in there without anyone noticing that we manipulated it and then maybe cause an effect upon pasting that is not appreciated? And of course we can, we just saw this, but how can we do this? So, who was that? <laughs> so it's such poor performance, I'm really disappointed. Are we going to end this now? No. Um, so here we again have a document, and this time I chose OpenOffice because, not because it's particularly interesting, because, but because it makes it really, really easy to understand what is going on here, because OpenOffice file formats are just like so easy to reverse engineer or to have a look at. We create an ODT file in LibreOffice or whatever, StarOffice, OpenOffice, whatever you want to choose, and we create some text in there. And now important, we also have to kind of give that text some layout, as in like, formatting like the color, the background, and give it, give it some properties that kind of elevates it from being like just black and white text, but have some actual properties that are worth being transported into the clipboard by the application. So now we have a look at this thing, and I wrote a little tool um, in the browser that can be reached uh, with the URL html5sec.org slash copy paste, so easy to remember. And there I can just like paste what I copied from LibreOffice, and then down here in this fairly ugly text area, I can see what the result is. So what the application, LibreOffice, creates, and then what the browser makes out of that, because there's always those two steps involved. And again, I see this kind of ugly HTML here. It's not much nicer what LibreOffice produces, so let's not wail on Microsoft too much. Um, here's the whole thing in a little bit more readable representation. And we see that there's interesting things in the pasted output. Interesting if you're into browser security and web security, because you always know when there are strings involved and not just XML or actual formatting, then things get fishy. And we see that here are strings. Here we have one, liberation song. Here we have one point micro high, and we have low hit Hindi. Those are, what are these? Who knows it? Those are font names. And font names are always interesting because font names are strings, and font names are awesome. We can do so many bad things with font names. You wouldn't, it's just like font names are awesome. So we assume that if we control the font name in the document, then this might actually reflect in the pasted content that we then have arrived in the browser. So we need to find more things that correspond. And the first thing are the font names. Other things correspond as well. But font names are strings. And if you have a close look, you will see that this is like the only occasion of actual strings 
that correspond with what we have in the document. So this might give us like a very, very important first hint as to what we should mess with to cause an attack, to create an attack. And if you remember when I had this document open, you saw that I was using the font name Liberation Song. However, if my locale was set to Chinese, I would have seen something else. It wasn't, but if I had set it to Chinese. The information is still there, but I just didn't use this locale. So it's kind of hidden from my eyes, which is cool, because if I would mess around with this thing, I would potentially see it. However, if I mess around with this thing, and I'm not in China, then I might actually be able to mess with something that stays, but is not visible from my eye, which is important for having like an effective phishing attack or whatever we want to do with this. So um, I wanted to find out if I can mess with this inside the core of the document. And as you all know, an open office document is basically a zip file. So you can rename it to zip, you can open this as a zip file, and you will see that there's like a folder structure in there, and you see like a configurations to folder, meta in folder, thumbnail folder, and so on. You see a content XML, which guess what contains, yes, the content, a manifest, metadata, MIME type settings, and the styles XML. And we already have this thing with the font name, so we kind of have an idea of what and where this is going. So let's have a look at the styles XML. And once we open the styles XML, it pretty much looks like this. We see XML that contains an office namespace and certain tag names and certain attributes under that namespace. We see a lot of SVG going on in here, always a good sign. We see a lot of style attributes being in here. And we again see the stuff that corresponds, which is now highlighted in yellow. We again see when Quan Yi micro high. So what if we go ahead and just like play with that and change it? Will it then correspond with the pasted output from our copy operation? Maybe it will. So what I did first was to realize that in the original data, let me just go back one step, we are inside a style element. So we have the style element here, and then inside the style element we have a string that is, oh, that is this kind of outlining the font name. So maybe I can break that style element and do something better with that. And that is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm just taking an HTML escape style element, but a closing style element. So I have the lesser than here, that is basically this thing, and then I have the slash to initiate the closing style, then I have the name style to close the style element, then I have the greater than, then I have the lesser than again to start a new element, then I close the new element, which is like a strike element, and then I give it some value like 000, and then I copy it, then I paste it into the browser, and I check if there is something that is struck through. Because if that is the case, then I successfully broke the style element and created a new element. And wonder, oh wonder, that works. I'm not going to demo this because you can try this yourself. And all the course or, or the training or slash talk materials are online. So you have like the perfect playground for that and can just like try it yourself. It works. You can inject new HTML. I was like, cool, that's, that's a nice attack. So simple. I'm done here. I can go home. But uh, that wasn't the case. Because once I try to just like go ahead and elevate this to actual cross-site scripting and using a script element or an iframe element or an applet or embed or object or anything nasty, nothing would come back. I said, oh, how's that? How's that? Why does why does not anything? Why, where is my stuff? I injected this. So strike through headline one p elements, diff elements, span elements. They all echoed, but style, iframe, embed, object did not. It's like wait a second. This indicates the presence of a sanitizer, and in fact that is true. Browsers, be it Firefox, be it Chrome, be it Internet Explorer, or any of the Chrome uh, uh, derivatives like Opera and whatnot, they indeed do use an internal sanitizer. So whenever they receive something from the clipboard, they first have a look at this thing. So like, ah, is this something fishy here? No, nothing fishy. Let's put it into the DOM. <coughs> so that's a problem because that kind of mitigates my attack or my imaginary attack that didn't even work yet. It's like, ah, sanitizers. I've spent my entire life dealing with sanitizers, so let's have a look at this one. I try to bypass it. And uh, I realized that the basic tricks don't really work. I'm just going to grab my beer real quick. There we go. And that I cannot just like trick around with like script elements or this and this and that or event handlers or JavaScript URIs. That all didn't work. I needed something more advanced. And um, I remember my own research from 2011 when I was having a look at SVG, at scalable vector graphics. And I also remember that scalable vector graphics back then hit the browser world because the specifiers decided that SVG should be the new it format for browsers in terms of vector graphics. And it was partly a good, partly a bad decision. Um, but at least back then, it yielded a lot of interesting JavaScript execution vectors for us. Why not try one of these? 
So I went through the process of taking one of the more complex SVG JavaScript execution vectors, encoding the whole thing, shaping it the right way, and then putting it into the styles XML, doing this, doing that, doing that, then doing the copying, then doing the paste it, and realized SVG comes through, and it's not being prohibited. So yes, this is like a partial bypass. So I kept working on this, and eventually came up with this monstrosity. Um, I think it's obvious, so we can skip to the next slide, what it's doing. Um, anyone wants to explain what this is doing? It's actually quite fascinating. So here, we have the closing style. And then we have the opening SVG. Then inside this SVG, we have another style. Then we have certain um, property value pairs in CSS that are making sure that the whole thing is overlapping the entire page. Um, I could have put them all together in one single style sheet, but then I would have to use semicolons, and weirdly, semicolons get filtered. So I couldn't use semicolons. I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. So I open the style element, close it. I open it again, I close it again. I open it again, I close it again. So just to get around those bloody semicolons. And I gave this like an impressive width, an impressive height, a little bit of opacity that is zero so we cannot see it. And then I close the final style element, and then I start a new element, which is a link, a classic anchor. And I give it the proper namespace, XML and S, X, link, HTTP, and so on and so on. And I give it an empty href. So this link is, no, it's not really empty, so it's like question mark. So the link is just pointing to itself. Super harmless, you may say, and yes, it is. It's super harmless, doesn't do anything. Then inside this link, I put a circle. And I give this circle like a really tremendously huge radius of 4,000 whatever unit ever. Um, I don't specify the unit, I just have the browser choose because it's gonna choose for me anyway. I close the circle, and then inside the link next to the circle, we have the animate element. An animate element is like the most amazing thing. I love this element so much. So do you know the history of SVG? Um, SVG is basically like, like a chimera of PGML, precision graphics markup language from Adobe, and VML, uh, vector markup language from Microsoft. And they both had like these kind of, kind of competing standards, standards back then. And then the W3C came and said, like, yeah, we need something that you know, is like unified, so quit the fighting, just like do something together. And then they took like the best elements out of those two standards and smooshed them together into SVG. Um, Adobe's contribution was a bit bigger than Microsoft's content, alongside his little brother, the set element. Because it allows us to declaratively, without using any scripting, animate the surrounding element. So if I have this link here, and inside this link we have the animate, then there is like an instant implicit relationship between the link and the animate element. The animate element will also and always and only influence the link, so the parent element. And I would say like, hey parent element, I want to do stuff to you. I want to take like for example attribute name and thereby decide which attribute it wants to animate. And now you might say like, you can never animate a URL, like why would anyone ever want to animate a URL, how idiotic is that? But it works and it's even in the standards, so you can animate URLs. So we want to animate the attribute xlink href. So this says, hey, of my parent element, I want to animate this one, which is then this one, and so it corresponds. And I want to start at second zero, or whatever time unit, browser chooses seconds, and I want to animate from JavaScript alert document domain to something that is invalid in the XML domain, because you cannot just like animate to an ampersand. So the browser says like, yeah, um, I'm gonna try to animate to the ampersand, and then it realizes, oh shoot, I can't do this. So let's get back to where I was before. Oh crap, I forgot that. So let's get back to the from value. So this is how we trick the browser into animating the link into something that was never there, but the browser assumes it was there, and then we have the XSS because we have a JavaScript URI. It's that easy. So the only thing I, that has to be done right now is of course to um, kind of sorry for the messed up fonts, is kind of encode the whole thing and throw it into the style attributes, the style name attributes, so we can see this thing here, and it does this and this and this and this, and this is the full payload. Then I save this inside the zip file that is my ODT, then I update the zip file, then I rename it back to ODT, then I open it with OpenOffice, then I write something, then I copy paste it into the browser, and there is the XSS. That is what we just saw in the first, first five minutes of this presentation. So that's cool. That is a result that we can see in the DOM. Um, we have content eligible faults, so it's clickable. We have the SVG, we have the multitude of style elements, we have the link here, we have the animate too, so we see the link is harmless. That is why the sanitizer of the browser doesn't pick it up. And then we have the animate element, which animates to a harmless value from something, and this is again why the browser doesn't pick it up, and then we have the bypass, which is quite nice and useful. 
So to go through this step by step so you don't have to kind of reverse engineer my process of creating this, I created like an ordered list for you. So that we create an open office document, we name it from ODT to zip, we open the zip, edit the styles XML, we find the occasion of the string micro high, we change it, we use the HTML encoder representation of the bypass, we put it in there, we save the whole thing, we kind of rename it back to zip, from zip to ODT, we open it from open office, LibreOffice, star office, whatever you want to do, and we copy paste it and then we have the attack. And the interesting thing is that even if you change around in the document, even if you change something, it will survive. Because you're not in China, and we're editing something that is only for Chinese locale. So you will always just see the harmless font name that we never touched, but the Chinese font name or the, Hindu, or the Hindi font name will always be there because we never really edit it. Only if we change our locale, then OpenOffice will say, like, oh, now we should take the Asian font, and then it will change, which is quite subtle. So this attack survives, changes, removing the text, writing entirely new text, reformatting the text, setting different colors and backgrounds, anything. Whatever you do in this document, this attack will stay in there, unless you go to China, um, or to some other country where you change the fonts from. So this is quite nice. And I was, I was wondering if this is only open office and only Firefox and Chrome, because it was getting interesting. And I tried, like, hmm, there's this document format that is called PDF, some people know it. And <laughs> there's the software that is called Adobe, um, does anyone know what Adobe really means? Don't look it up. Like, really, don't look it up. Don't look it up. Um, really, don't look it up. Uh, <laughs> so I tried to, to mess with the PDF and to get the same effect. And I remember that font names are interesting. So I, again, look for the font names inside the PDF. And a PDF file is not a zip, right? So you cannot just, like, rename it to zip and then go in there and have, like, a directory structure. That doesn't work because it's, like, some, um, some kind of binary construct that has, like, different containers and container IDs and then does things. But as you can see here is a little teaser, and no one says Bieber, um, or beeps. Um, it still works, and stuff is going on. The question is, how do we do it now? Well, here it was a bit more simple, and that was like the second example I was playing with, because I basically just had to take a hex editor, open the raw PDF, find the place where the font names are, manipulate these, test, and realize that I can do it too. Um, although there were some constraints. So the first constraint was that the font name cannot be longer than 32 characters. So I had, to, I had to squeeze my payload into 32 characters. That sucked, but it was possible. And I also learned that in PDF, font names cannot contain parentheses. So I was like, hmm, ah, that sucks. I have to find like an executing vector that doesn't require parentheses. Yes, please. Could you export the, the uh, ODT? Maybe you should take the microphone, or just, just in case so everybody. Quick question. Could you export the ODT and the PDF that stay there, or is there room to export it? Again, please. Could you export the ODT? That's a good question. I never tried this. Be my guest and try it out. All this stuff is going to be on GitHub or is already on GitHub, and you can just like start playing with it. Well, that's a very good question. Might be. I never tried this. Technically, it should be. Feel free to give it a try. So um, I had to find a JavaScript execution vector that gives me the possibility to execute arbitrary code within 32 characters and does not require parentheses. So that wasn't actually that hard because in IE10, uh, or even an IE11, if you set it to IE10 doc mode, you can use Visual Basic Script. Everybody loves VBS. And I just set the whole thing to language equals BBS, and then on click alert plus one, so I have the vector here. I could also go like, with, for example, eval plus name or something like this to have arbitrary JavaScript execution. Um, that is the result, fairly unspectacular. You see the font element, you see some attributes here that are coming from the generated stuff, and you see on click alert one, and that works because it's Visual Basic Script. Um, luckily, we're not limited to Visual Basic Script because thanks to ECMAScript Script 6, the new JavaScript, all very modern browsers, not necessarily the stable versions that are released right now, but all the very modern browsers also support the execution of functions without using parentheses, but with using backticks. That feature is called template strings. Uh, look it up, this changes a lot in the world of cross-site scripting. And uh, backticks, are perfectly cool inside a font name. Why wouldn't they, of course? Like, all my fonts are called Bactic, Bactic something. And you can just do this, and the PDF is not gonna scream. But there is, like, one more interesting detail to this. Um, if you open a PDF with Adobe Reader or Foxit Reader or whatever PDF reader we have out there, and then you expect the clipboard, you will notice that there is no HTML bucket because the Adobe Reader doesn't create an HTML bucket. It just doesn't. It creates like the text bucket and the Unicode text bucket and some other buckets, but no HTML bucket. But still, it works at IE. And I was like, how does that work? And you have a closer look and you realize that the Adobe Reader creates a rich text format bucket. And that IE itself 
has its own conversion mechanism to take RTF and turn it into HTML. So there is the actual bug, not somewhere else. So in the conversion process of the clipboard RTF bucket into actual HTML and then putting it into the browser store. So yeah, um, that was one of the scratching my head findings <laughs> during this process. But that was fun and we couldn't exploit it. There's more things you can do with RTF. Um, we're gonna maybe talk about these uh, after the actual presentation. But bottom line is we have another XSS, this time from a PDF. And then I was like, hmm, why not try doc? Because everybody uses doc and sends around docs and people copy and paste like crazy from docs and doc, doc access and whatnot. And as you can see, big surprise, it also works. So how do we do it here? Again, we open the text, the hex editor, and we have a look at this uh, um, UTF-16 monstrosity that is a doc. See all these null bytes here for the enhanced byte width and so on. And we can see here, which is like a bit art, that there is stuff in there that introduces a link, and this link is pointed to a JavaScript URI, and it has like content editable faults, so we can actually click it and whatnot. So again, we have another XSS. And the same with docx, which again is now XML based, so quite similar to what we see with ODT. And we again see the same pattern here. We mess with the font name, we add the right characters, the parser stumbles, creates something that it shouldn't create, puts it into the browser, and we have another cross site scripting. That's how it looks. It's a bit more complicated to get this work here, and eventually this one fired, this one didn't, this one didn't, but this one did. So it took me some more time. And it's almost the last one. Here would be another Bieber, so if you're still interested in this kind of deal that we're having, then now would be the time to just like beep it up. Good one. <laughs> Thank you so much. So yeah, again, here is the, the, the uh, ordered list that, that shows you how you do it. You create a doc file with a hyperlink in there. You go into this thing with a hex editor. You mess around with a hyperlink. You add some HTML around it because you can add, add, add actual HTML. Then you copy paste the whole thing into the browser and again, you have an XSS. So it's not really hard. And it shows to some point that whatever document format you take, you can, you can exploit them all, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. You just have to go in there with a hex editor or open it as a zip file or whatever it is. It's like, hmm, so is there any limits? It's just like, that, that is not good, that's not healthy. And then I found the limit, and that was like the challenge. And uh, that was really nasty. So there is XPS, who knows XPS? XPS is this thing that Microsoft once tried to establish as like the PDF killer, so like a portable embedded document format that no one ever uses. And uh, XPS is hard. So I created my XPS, and I had a look at this thing, it was like binary garbage. And it's like, hmm, what's that? I cannot read this, there's no strings in here. And then I had to look at the Wikipedia entry and learn that they used their own proprietary encryption, uh, uh, compression mechanism or algorithm. And I was like, oh, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna relearn this. I was looking for some tools to kind of deflate it for me, but there was not anything that I could find. I was like, ah, that sucks. But I still wanted to kind of cause an attack with that. So I couldn't find any correspondence of the font name that I was choosing inside the actual file because it was compressed and I was too lazy to deflate it. So what could we do here? Well, the first idea that came to mind, maybe it was the second, was to actually create a malicious font and just embed it in there on the attacker system. So I grabbed a nice tool. Here's the effect of the attack. We're going to see how this worked later on. I grabbed a nice tool that is called FontForge. It's an amazing open source tool I really like that was so useful in so many situations. And I had a look at a commonly freely available true type font. And I downloaded it and loaded it in this tool, which is like some random font. And I had a look at all the properties of that font. And I went through all of them, like the PS names, general settings, and so on, and eventually arrived at the TTF names, finding all those strings, tested this, tested that, tested that. And finally, I found out that the one string, that one property inside the font that is corresponding with the pasted text is the English US string for preferred family. I have no idea why, but this eventually arrives in the browser. It's like, why? So I played with this thing and to put some stuff in here, saved the font, installed the font on a freshly installed Windows, used that Windows, booted it up, created a document on there, embedded this font into the document, saved the document, saved it as XPS, then took that XPS, sent it to a different system, opened it there without that font being installed on that other system, pasted it into the browser, and it worked because it was embedded. That was awesome. <laughs> so that worked. Um, that malicious font is also part of the GitHub, so you can play with that thing. Uh, but all thanks goes to the authors of this amazing tool. Um, so here we actually take a font, we make it malicious, and then we embed it into the document, and then we send around the document, and then the font stays with all its malicious properties because pff, compression, no loss of data, and uh, it works. 
And the beautiful thing is that it doesn't even require clicks or user interaction because in there we can just like hide iframes and whatnot because strangely, and I think this is yet another different bug, IE doesn't sanitize anything that comes from XPS. It would sanitize everything that comes from Doc and DocX, but not from XPS because that is special. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I hope so. But if you ever do, this just like, don't, don't copy and don't even paste. Like you can copy, but you can never paste. <laughs> so yeah, that's just like giving you a quick overview of what we've seen so far and to, to understand that there is even more potential. We can copy from PDF and paste into the browser, we have XSS. We can copy from doc, docx into the browser, we have XSS. We can copy from XPS into the browser, we have XSS. We can copy from ODT into the browser, we have XSS. And it affects Office, LibreOffice, PDF Reader, Foxit Reader, whatever you want to take. Um, and it affects all the browsers that I tested. It affects MSIE, Chrome, Opera, Safari, Firefox, anything WebKit, anything out there. So there was not a single browser that is, that is unaffected by this, which is crazy. Almost every single time was different vectors. So for each product, I had to customize this a little bit. But in the end, it worked with every single browser out there. Um, needless to say, I filed bug reports and uh, respected the 90-day uh, disclosure policy. Firefox is working on it. It should already be fixed in Aurora. Um, Chrome has a ticket and MS has a ticket and I think they're working on it. So I don't want to cause more damage than necessary. But they know this problem and they're working on it but the only ones who actually fix it immediately and were working on this uh, intensely was, was the Firefox team so kudos to them. Um, and if you think about this thing, I was just like giving you like a very, very small slice of the cake saying like, okay, we have some of the software and we have the browser. But if you think about the general topic, you might see that there's like so much potential because there's so many things where we copy from and so many other things that we paste into that you just want to play with this and have a look at what goes. And you have the tools now. You have the possibility to have a look at what is inside the clipboard. You understand now what those buckets are, how to analyze them, and even what the interesting properties are that you might want to modify namely strings, be it font names, be it something else, but have a look at the strings because with these, you can do amazing stuff. In Excel, for example, I realized when I copy something from a text file or from a website or a different Excel file and then paste it into a different Excel spreadsheet, then certain security mechanisms are just not existing anymore. So I can, for example, use the amazing web service formula. Does anyone know what the web service formula is? I think they introduced it with Excel 2013. And it sends a web service request to an arbitrary FTP or HTTP URL. And uh, what it did was basically build a port scanner. So you would throw this into your Excel, and then it was like, if web service, this and this and this IP with that port is bigger than one, oh, there is something. If not, if this and this and this is bigger than one, oh, if it's not, and so on and so on, and just like do it many, many times. And then eventually I had a port scanner that was upon success, because if it is bigger than none, uh, big, bigger than one, the actual response, sending another request to my server and telling me, hey, on this internet IP, this port is open, so have fun with it now. That can be done with a web service, and it's only working on copy and paste, because otherwise, if you just open the Excel without copy and paste, and it's already in there, then the security manager is like, yeah, can't you see you? <laughs> Sorry for being snarky, but it was really cool to realize that, that apparently for copy and paste, the security functions are turned off, or at least more lax than they are usually, which makes it even more interesting because apparently there is like, the software differentiates between something that is already there and something that is pasted into it. I tried macros, but that didn't work, so that would be too nice. Um, yeah, but maybe you can find a way to do so. Um, and there's even more surface, and that is really scary. So there's Flash. And Flash has almost never been in the press for bad security, almost never, <laughs> except for like 50 times. Ah, maybe a bit more. Ah, maybe even more. Anyway, um, Flash is cool because Flash gives you a lot of possibilities, and Flash has its own clipboard API. So in Flash, you can read and write the clipboard. However, it requires you to do a bunch of interaction before it allows you to unlock the holy safe of the clipboard. To read the clipboard, you have to have a paste operation or a copy operation. But to write the clipboard, write into the clipboard, you only need a click. And that is necessary. I mean, you know these kind of flash clipboard managers and all these tools that are being used on certain websites and rich text editors. Yes, they only require a click. And then you have full write access to the clipboard. The beautiful thing is that in Flash, you can not only just fill the text bucket, but you can also fill the RTF bucket or the HTML bucket. And I was like, hmm, yeah, but then you have like browser to browser and whoever does that, I mean, it's kind of obvious. But then I realized that you can also go ahead and just like take a flash file, make it malicious, 
by taking event, delaying this event a little bit, waiting a little bit, and then using this event to fill the clipboard because it's still a trusted event. And I take the flash file and I embed it into a PDF because you can do that. You can embed flash inside PDF. So I have a PDF and you can just like select something, some text inside this PDF. So you have that click. And then you just like wait a little bit. So you release the mouse again and then you copy it. And then the actual event fires and then refills the clipboard with your stuff and not the stuff that you actually copied or with the attacker stuff. And you can just like fill the HTML bucket or the RTF bucket and then a lot, of, a lot of fun is being had and this can be done. So I'm not even sure how you, how you can fix this um, because it's a feature, like you cannot just like take it away. Um, so yeah, um, I think it was like an academic revolution because you know I have like copy paste detection because you can publish a paper as PDF and someone copies something and throws it into Word or another PDF editor and then it sends on the background request and you know, oh, someone pasted stuff from my PDF, uh, pro probably plagiarizer. <laughs> Academia was blown away by my ideas. No, <laughs> they weren't. Um, so yeah, this is, this is something you can also do. And uh, there is more APIs and more software that allows you to directly influence the contents of the clipboard. Not necessarily read, but write it. And I was thinking about defense. And, uh, well, aside from just like contact the browser vendors, um, I couldn't come up with too much. Um, I spoke with Giorgio Maona of NoScript, and he more or less, he always does that, he more or less immediately wrote a fix. So when you use NoScript, you're fine against all of these attacks. Like nothing can ever happen, you're perfectly fine. So, yeah. Um, within hours, literally. So um, whenever I have a bypass, he fixes it within hours. That's a shame. Um, <laughs> Um, what I was trying to do was just like to, to kind of at least do a little bit of defense because you have to kind of, right? It's like a certain obligation. Uh, that's the least fun part. So I wrote a browser extension for Chrome that is hijacking uh, all the paste events and taking the pasted content with like a little trick and a fake text area and taking our own tool, DOM Purify, that's what I was introducing in the beginning, and pumping all the clipboard content through DOM Purify. And whenever I show this thing, at a conference, it doesn't work. Like, it just doesn't work. Whenever I try it at home, it works. So I'm not gonna show it right now. It just simply won't work. Um, it's on GitHub, but don't use it. It doesn't work. I don't know why. And I'm, I did something defense-wise. That's, that's good enough, I guess. <laughs> so having said this, I think the best solution here for you as a user and uh, for you as someone who wants to avoid being clipboarded or dolphined or whatever you may want to call it, um, just don't use Control-V. Uh, Use Control Shift V because it's safer, because it doesn't give you the formatted text. It only gives you the unformatted, the raw text. It only gives you the text bucket and nothing else. So unless you need explicitly use the Control V for formatted text, use Control Shift V. It's better. Um, here's a little bit of code that I was using for the, for the uh, Chrome extension. Um, it was a nasty trick that I was working with onload and uh, that I was creating like an invisible text area on the background page of the Chrome extension that I was focusing this thing um, then we're adding another event handler, uh, event listener that is listening for paste events. Then I would take this whole thing and then I use something that is undocumented and I found this out, found out about this by, by accident. So you have the clipboard API inside the event model, then you can call get data and usually you can fill it with two possible parameters that is text in URL, but I learned that it's also possible to use the non-documented text slash HTML and then you get actual access to the HTML clipboard um, and then you execute like a fake paste event and then you can send it through DOM Purify. But that is not reliable at all. It was just like an attempt to fix the issue in Chrome. <coughs> anyway, um, we're almost at the end of the presentation and uh, we can talk about future work because I think there is a lot of future work. I mean, you have an attack that does require user interaction, but I believe it is user interaction that is far more likely than, for example, people self accessing themselves by copying a link and putting it in the browser bar or something like this because one does that. One takes content from a document and pastes it somewhere and usually we don't have a look at what we're actually pasting. We believe to know what we're copying, but we have no idea what we're actually pasting because there's so many things that can happen in transit between the copy and the paste process that we have no transparency on. So there, is, there is no easy, convenient tools that show us constantly what the content of our clipboard is. We have to actually demand that information every single time we do this, which is killing our productivity, so no one does it. Um, I think clipboard interaction is a major convenience tool, but given the fact that we don't see what's going on, it's also a significant risk. And if you take this whole thing and put it on the level of bear phishing and add some convincing text in an email and try to kind of socially 
trick the user into actually taking something from your document that is seamlessly safe, survive the AV, survive the firewall and everything, and then you copy paste something and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the payload unfolds, that ain't good. So I think there's potential to use this in an actual rogue scenario. So I think we can, we can safely reach a conclusion here and so say, be careful when you copy and paste. You can copy whatever you want, but please be careful when you paste because it can bite you in the ass. One day it will maybe. I still remember these, these old tricks from like those Linux sysadmin forums where people were like, oh, I have Ubuntu 9 right now, but my dual monitor setup doesn't work. Oh, just take this uh, login as root and, and paste it into your console. It's going to be fine. So <laughs> yeah, font size zero, and there you go, a lot of boxes. Um, <laughs> this goes a bit beyond that, I guess. So just be very careful. One day something's going to happen. We have no idea what kind of interactions happen between applications and what kind of consequences arise from that. Maybe there's code execution in there, maybe not. Maybe there's local file disclosure in there, maybe there is not. Maybe there's like XML attacks in there, maybe there's not, I have no idea. We just had a look at XSS so far, which already was fairly complex, but that specific field, like the specific area, the specific surface, allows for literally every single possible attack that is out there, so maybe we should have a look. And that's it. Um, you can ask questions now, I will try to answer them. Um, you can have comments now, even if they're snarky. I'm very thankful for uh, having me here. The entirety of talk material and proof of concepts are on GitHub, so you just go on this link. Um, the slides are on SlideShare in my account, so you can also find them. I'm pretty sure they're going to be published here. So everything you need to play with this, it's out there, and please do so. I highly encourage that. Do whatever you want with it. Publish, extend, whatever you think is right. Thank you very much. browser. Yes. Is there any way in which you could corrupt one of the um, system or application configuration files like the .normal file in Word so that they could be attacked even if they copy from a document that they trust? As opposed that is to a good question. Document. I mean, you, you can of course compromise templates with that, so dot .files or something like this, but that also assumes that the attacker gets the file across to the victim in the first place. Um, so I haven't found any way that is, that is working across documents or something like that. That would be pretty cool. Um, the only thing would maybe be like the XPS trick. If you open the XPS and then for some miraculous reason the font is being installed in your system, but that is pretty abstract. And uh, my main focus was like what can you do if that act of copy pasting actually happens? Aside from the Flash example where you only need a click with the Flash inside the PDF. But as mentioned, I think there is more that can be done. Like, 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 could, could, it, could, could it, actually it actually spread virally if you had, like, a malicious font you installed on a PC that had the payload embedded, and then that font goes into another document, and people copy and paste into an, an I, don't, I don't know what I'm trying to explain Maybe here. it can, but I think there's, there's, more, there's more magic necessary yeah. to make that happen. So I'm aware that I'm just scratching the surface here, but I think there's more, so that's why I'm pretty much encouraging to, to have a deeper look at this because we don't know what's going on in the Clipper. We can't see it unless we really want to, and that, that's the part that sucks. It's interesting you mentioned WebKit because I was curious because in Apple, they have WebKit embedded everywhere throughout the OS, hmm. and you can p copy and paste HTML into anywhere and will render as HTML. So I'm very wondering if you, say, copy and paste into TextPad, uh, sorry, text, text edit, which can render HTML, hmm. if these exploits will actually execute from even within text edit. Might be. Please <laughs> be my guest and play with this and publish on this. Like, go ahead. I think there is many things to explore. But could be. I think with Qt there is like the same issue because they also accept like a limited set of uh, HTML elements. And you can at least do like background requests and, and do tracking and stuff like that. Not sure if you can go beyond. That is yet to be found out. This might be a dumb question, but does it does copy and pasting this attack just work um, sort of naively browser to browser between sites, between tabs? Um, not that anyone would ever do that browser to browser, especially not different browser into other browser, um, but it does work. Uh, it's a bit different, and someone else asked this question already on Twitter, and yes, it does work, but you have to have, again, different vectors. But I think that is far less likely to actually ever occur in the wild by a real life victim because why would they open IE in Firefox and then copy from the one to the other? But it wouldn't work within a browser. Like I'm on one site, I copy and paste something into 
Interesting, Gmail. Interestingly, that does work, but it's again different. Um, I haven't gone to the bottom of this fully because I assume that when it comes from a different application, then there is no actual DOM to kind of, kind of note, iterate over and sanitize, but they take the string and parse it. Remember this thing when I talked about the semicolons that kind of get messed up? I believe that is a side effect on that, but I have, I have no proof yet. I talked to the Mozilla guys, um, and they also had a hard time finding of why the semicolon were so messed up. I believe that the browser thinks that you're still inside the CSS, still inside the stream, because it doesn't realize that the closing style breaks it. So they parse semicolon as a terminator and CSS, and then they start a new property. So I think that is why things got messed up when I used the semicolon and forced me to use these multiple style elements. That, however, does not happen if you copy from one browser into the same browser, because then it seems to be having a DOM, and this artifact doesn't show, and the bypasses are different um, or not even working. So I think I couldn't get a bypass working browser to browser in Firefox. And I think it was hard to impossible in Chrome, and I think it was possible in IE, but I also spent some more time because they seem to have more insight into what is being copied there. Not take a string, but take an actual document. And that makes a huge difference. But this is, this is just an assumption. I don't have any proof for that. This is just what I believe. Any other questions? I had one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had one last question about the the defensive side. Mm. What you know in your mind? I mean, it's not you're, you're you're not in charge of implementing the fix, but what do you think is the right fix? Is it is it just fortifying the sanitizer with yes. additional blacklists, yes. or is it something fundamentally different? I think uh, that is that is the thing that should be done here. Like just like enhance the filtering capacity or capability of that sanitizer because it already works quite fine from browser to browser. It just doesn't work fine from external application to browser, and I think this can be done. So you might just increase the range of the blacklist and add more elements to it, which might be suboptimal, or you could change the behavior based on my assumption that I issued earlier that it's not having a real DOM. But if you do so, if you give it a real DOM, then this bug might just go away in a second. But that's, of course, not for me to decide. That's, again, just an assumption. However, I think that the Firefox people actually went this direction. There is a ticket to this. Um, I haven't linked it in the slides, unfortunately. Um, I'm not even sure if it's public yet. But uh, it's, this went this direction. So in the new Firefox versions, and the non-stable versions are already fixed. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that they did actually this. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, my, my sad and desperate attempt of writing a Chrome extension kind of went this direction, but yeah, my coding was just too bad. So I'm pretty sure that you can do this. And we had this idea in the team as well, just like, yeah, what we need right now is a copy-paste firewall or a clipboard firewall. It's a billion dollar idea, but uh, we never followed that path. <laughs> as you can see, I'm still wearing like standard shirts and not pure gold. I just wondered if you tried making your own um, virus or whatever, like... Um, Again? I, I wondered if you tried attacking the system. What I'm thinking is what if... Could you send an email to somebody and they copy something out of that email and you're saying, like, it might have JavaScript in there? I am pretty sure that this is possible, but this is definitely one of the vectors that I didn't try yet because I'm hesitant to ins install Outlook and even set it up. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that you can find something that might work. So if I get an email from you, it could have hidden JavaScript that maybe gets my contact list or something. Yeah, it, it doesn't even have to be hidden JavaScript. It could be forms with, like, input type password. It could be HTTP requests that are going out. Depending on the context, you can do a lot of things in HTML, but I do believe that this might be possible because if you have a look at how email clients treat malicious code inside HTML emails, then they just deactivate the capability of doing something with them. So the script elements are still there. Yeah. They just don't script because the email client doesn't script. So if you copy something, then you might just be lucky and the script is still there or the iframe or whatever, and then it arrives somewhere else and does something. But this is another path to explore. I simply don't know. I'm wondering, is there, um, is it possible to have executable code, though, in there? Is that what, I mean, Maybe. Wouldn't it, isn't that what it'd take? Because, like, my, know, my, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm just thinking, what would be, 
what would be the worst case? Like we also depends. I mean, yeah. executable code is always nice um, if you want to trojanize a box. <laughs> um, but depending on the context, like an XSS can be nice, tracking can be nice, password leakage can be nice, local file disclosure can be nice, XXE can be nice, XEE can be nice. You never know. Depends on the context. But I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of things that also work from within the email client, copy it there, and then paste it somewhere else. But this, as I mentioned, yet so has to be tried out. the CC option of an email and Gmail. For example. And it sends it out to the... Uh, I mean, I just, I just made one tiny exploration into the from somewhere else into the non-browser world and that ended up in having like an Excel port scanner. So there might be more. And I spent like 10 minutes I on I never that, got so. those font problems on the Mac, just hmm? to note. <laughs> what do you mean? My plug for the Macintosh, I've never had that kind of font problem where you, you know, font's missing. It uh. seems like it goes to text. It reverts to plain text hmm. or something. But Could be. No, it should be. It should technically anyway. be. Anyway. <laughs> Interesting. So one of the fixes is control shift V. Yeah. Does that mean if you just have caps lock on the entire time and you just control V, you'll be fine, you'll be safe on the internet? Yeah, so message takeaway, keep caps lock on all times on the internet. You'll be safe. So like ag aggressive people are safer on the internet. Yes. Because they're not pro Good. That's yes, good. That's pretty yes, good. Yes, yes. I love it. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mario. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thank you for coming. Let's head on upstairs and get out. <laughs>